Welcome to the Missing Links Podcast. I'm your host, Geeky Kit. And I'm your co-host, Anna Lidicat. We're going to be discussing the issues with women in the gaming space and the importance of male allyship in overcoming these societal obstacles. Today, I'd like to talk about the statistics surrounding women growing as a gamer group and the hesitation that women have experienced in identifying themselves as such. So to get us started, let's look at the statistics of women since the pandemic, since that started shifting things a little bit. Right, so there has been an exponential increase in female gamership partially attributable to pandemic lockdowns. In 2020, 41% of US gamers were women, according to Statista. In 2021, 45%. In 2022, 48%. In 2023, a slight downturn, 46% of US women identified as gamers. Online gaming among female players is growing at a rate of approximately 33% annually, and women are predicted to dominate the gaming landscape within the next year. All right. So if we break that down in terms of the console wars versus PC gamers, I'm wondering what that looks like. Uh, because we know that there is a little bit of a difference, or at least has been historically, in the types of um, mediums that women use versus men use. So according to Kotaku, in the U.S., 52% of Switch owners, 45% of Xbox owners, and 41% of PS5 owners are female. And according to Sakana's Player Pulse, 47% of console players, 50% of PC video game players, and 54% of mobile video game players are female. Okay. All right. So, so that does, for the most part, uh, sound like what we've generally seen, which is a preference, if you will, to the Nintendo Switch and to mobile games. And I think the reason that we're still seeing this, although it definitely seems like it's evening out, I mean, those percentages are not all that far from each other, but I think the reason that we continue to see the preferential treatment of the Switch and mobile gaming is because of the library of games available on those systems. So when you think of the Nintendo Switch, uh, they have a lot in terms of the cozy game genre. So games like Stardew Valley and Rune Factory and Story of Seasons and, and these kind of slower paced, more relaxing games. They usually have, you know, kind of cutesy art styles to them and, and nice music and you can farm and you can gather resources and create a family and build relationships and stuff like that. Um, and we see a lot of those games available on mobile devices as well. And also keeping in mind that mobile gaming is something that has been really kind of exploding over the past, uh, I don't know, maybe 10-ish or so years, because you know we're coming from a time where, for you and I at least, we remember when cell phones were just starting to become a thing, and then the flip phone was like the thing, and then the, you know, now the flip phone is almost non-existent. The smartphone is the thing that everybody has, no matter where you fall uh, in societal status. So I think that's also attributable to what we've seen um, in the percentage of people playing on mobile phones uh, then versus now. And again, that library of games available, I think it just tends to be a little more attractive, if you will, to female players. Uh, but as I said, those those numbers are really starting to even out here. Mm, definitely. And I remember when cell phones were basically just a brick with an antenna that only businessmen had. <laughs> But as far as you keep um, in the in the car, yeah. <laughs> but as far as uh, mobile games go, I think Nintendo was probably a bit of a gateway, given its family friendly content such as Mario Kart, and the fact that during these pandemic lockdowns, parents and children were thrust together for most of the day, and so children's gaming uh, habits may have been an influence on parents. Yep, that's a fair point too. During the pandemic, children uh, might have been being schooled from home. They might have been on a hybrid schedule where the school was rotating uh, which classes could be in the building and which ones had to be out. So they didn't have too many students in the building at the same time. And parents, while they might have been out of work, they might have been displaced because of the pandemic. They might have been working from home because of the pandemic. Um, they might have had to be home because of their children being home. So. Uh, they were definitely thrust together a lot more than usual. 
And on the one hand, the the parent is probably trying to keep the child occupied so that they're not losing their freaking mind having their kid around, you know, pretty much 24 seven with them. So it's like, here, play your switch, you know, leave me alone. So there's that. But also there was probably a, a desire from uh, the adults in the in the room as well to uh, take advantage of the extra time they had, right, to bond with their children because they don't typically have as much time with them and to potentially pick up some new hobbies of their own because for anyone who is really active and like to go out a lot, that wasn't really viable anymore. So they needed to kind of branch out and see what other things they could be interested in. So they sit down and watch their kid play like Stardew Valley or something. It's like, oh, well, that, that looks kind of nice. Hand me the controller. Let me try for a bit. So yeah, there was definitely an opportunity there for that uh, system to kind of uh, grow, <laughs> grow extra branches, if you will, touch extra people. Um, and, and I think that Nintendo was kind of like ripe for that kind of opportunity because it is such a, as you said, a family friendly console with so many friend, family friendly games on it. That was the one that the children were most likely already had in their hands when the pandemic came about. And the PS5 actually wasn't out quite yet. So that, that certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, so that kind of makes sense. And the pandemic lockdowns with respect to the rise of the cozy gaming genre also makes a lot of sense too, given that during hard times like the Great Depression, for example, or World War II, um, there is a growing interest in escapism. You know, uh, think Laurel and Hardy, for example, uh, you know, pack up your troubles for uh, 30 minutes in a, in a dark movie theater and mm -hmm. become engrossed in something that is uh, that is comforting, that is pleasant, that uh, brings humor uh, as, a, as a kind of light in the proverbial darkness. Yeah, no, that's a good point, too, um, because I think a lot of the people going through the pandemic, you know, it, video games in general are escapism, but sometimes when things are getting especially rough out there, you don't want to escape into something that's also very stressful. So when you think of action-packed games like FPSs and stuff, that might not be the kind of escapism you're looking for when you're already super stressed. Depends on the gamer, of course. But I think a lot of people, when they're going through so much tension on, you know, in, in real life, in this world, when they go into the gaming world, they're looking for something to kind of bring that back down to kind of equalize them internally, if you will. And cozy gaming is a really good way of doing that because uh, not only are you able to, you know, kind of project yourself into the character that you're playing in the game, but that character also isn't going through all these really stressful things of, you know, people or creatures hunting them down and trying to kill them. It's let's build this farm. Let's build relationships with the townspeople. Um, so I can definitely see how an event as stressful as the pandemic would make people want a different kind of escapism. Uh, I'd have to look into the stats, but I'd be surprised if there wasn't an increase in uh, people playing stuff like The Sims as well. Uh, another thing that I would personally consider a cozy game because it is such a low level stakes, if you will. Not that you can't kill your sim because you definitely can. I've done it. I've done it quite a few times. Like a gigapet? <laughs> well, you know, sometimes they're not very good at cooking and they just uh, set the house on fire. So there are some uh, stakes, yeah. some That's stakes relatable. to be had. <laughs> <laughs> um, but generally speaking, The Sims is, you know, a low pressure, kind of slower, even keeled kind of game where it's just about the building of relationships and getting a, a job that you actually want your character to have. And there's a, a micromanagement element to it that can be very comforting for people because it's like you get to take control of The Sim in their life when you don't feel like you're in control of your own life. So um, that's probably an element here, too in terms of like what kind of escapism people were looking for during the height of the pandemic and also in 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 the in you know in the midst of something uh, categorically abnormal you have these games that are sort of an idyllic iteration of the normal yeah that's that's a fair point too so let's talk about why women have been so hesitant 
to join the gaming space and to identify themselves as gamers? Well, 75% of females polled age 18 to 24 experienced abuse online. 35% received violent messages, 25% experienced depression from abuse, and 11% felt suicidal, according to Sky News. According to other data, 80% of women who experienced abuse said the messages were sexual in nature, 35% said the messages were violent or threatening, according to Sky Broadband. Women are hesitant to use the voice chat feature for fear of being identified as female and being specifically targeted. Males are routinely uh, receiving homophobic abuse, but females are treated like they don't even belong in gaming. And rape threats are incredibly common, according to the BBC Three. Women are targeted with distinct forms of harassment, such as sexually explicit hate speech and demands for personal information, unsolicited DMs and friend requests, trolling. The female presence is treated as a deliberate intrusion, a disruption, and a bid for male attention, according to Solari. Also, according to Solari, inclusivity and representation in games receives pushback against a perceived forced diversity. Yeah, so unfortunately, I, I'm not surprised by those statistics. Um, you know, being a female within the gaming space myself, uh, I have been on the receiving end of some some nasty behavior from males in the gaming space as well. Um, I, I've never gotten anything so severe as like a rape or death threat, which is a absolutely horrendous uh but i have definitely gotten stuff like you know what the heck are you doing in an fps game like back when i used to play call of duty or some heavy flirtation uh some sexual innuendos so yeah I, i've i've definitely uh been privy to those kinds of things and as a uh, as a teenager i would often game with groups with groups of male friends specifically, not not female friends, but male friends, uh, because they kind of created this like cocoon around you where if somebody started harassing you, well, then they just kind of, you know, bully them right out of it. So especially when playing MMOs, uh, I was not really online too much by myself. And when I was, I wasn't talking to people too often, uh, definitely not on voice chat. You know, by text, sometimes there would be some talking back and forth, but uh, voice chat, I kept very minimal and typically did not travel alone. And, and every once in a while, you'd meet a nice pe person on there, but especially for games that attract younger audiences, no offense to the younger male generation, but uh, when they're still, you know, maturing and, and uh, figuring things out and uh, trying to find themselves and everything, they can be... Uh, even more disruptive in that space. And women during their teen years uh, tend to be very unsure of themselves and have a lot of confidence issues and uh, anxiety. So it's just like another thing on top of so many other things that uh, women tend to deal with in just their day-to-day -day lives and just just the normal things of going to school, you know, and the harassment that you have to deal with there sometimes. Depressing statistics, but not surprising whatsoever. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe uh, Dr. K, or some of you may know uh, him by his channel name, which is Healthy Gamer GG. He actually did an interview with some female gamers uh, on this issue specifically. Yeah, and a lot of them uh, said that they were basically treated as an NPC. Uh, they received, uh, unsurprisingly, a lot of unwanted attention, angry reactions from male players if they didn't give them the expected or desired response, requests for nudes, uh, the proverbial nice guy routine, a la, you know, emotional manipulation, um, and the use of pretense to engage women in conversation. But when female players actually talked, they were uh, perceived as attention whores and were accused of flirting just because they were friendly. Uh, females tolerate an exorbitant amount of abuse and moderate their own behavior to prevent further harassment. When they do express uh, their feelings of being treated poorly, they're told they can't take a joke. They're told they don't belong. They should do what they're told. Uh, romantic rejections are met with murder threats, and people are even stalked. This abuse is normalized, and female gamers endure a different kind of normal. And if they try to do anything about it, they're accused of overreacting. Their responses are essentially gatekept by male gamers. 
only 5% of video games showcase female protagonists, then perhaps that is part of the problem since representation is very important and has real world impacts. Most female characters are objectified and hypersexualized and frequently portrayed as the love interest of a male character. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, I think representation in the gaming space is getting better over time. I do think it's moving in the right direction. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely still a, a trend, if you will, of the female characters in games just being very exaggerated. The breasts are exaggerated. The butt is exaggerated. All of the curves are exaggerated. The hair is always, you know, full and flowy and the face is always perfect. Um, and it's just, it sets people up to have unrealistic expectations, essentially. And that's not to say that you can't have attractive characters in your games. Absolutely. Um, and that's not to say that you can't have games that are super cartoony where everything is exaggerated. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, when we hear stories like, uh, you know, gamers freaking out because uh, I believe it was Tifa whose breasts Tifa were Lockhart. like, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. it was Tifa whose breasts were like reduced a bit in the <laughs> remake of Final mm -hmm. Fantasy VII. And there was just like this outcry of like, how dare you make her boobs a little more realistic? Um, and it's just so silly. It's like, she's still a beautiful cartoon character. All they did was just make her body just slightly more realistic in the way that it looks. Um, and there was also some outcry about uh, the female protagonist of Horizon Zero Dawn, uh, Aloy, because she doesn't look feminine enough. You know, you made her ugly. What the heck? And it's like, I personally, I don't think she's actually ugly. Is she super attractive over the top? No, she just looks normal. <laughs> but like she, uh, you know, obviously the, the stuff she wears and the way she does her hair isn't what we typically see. She's in a fantasy setting or well, mm -hmm. fantasy sci-fi setting because it's future based. Um, but she just kind of looks like a normal woman. Uh, there was some outcry about how you could see like peach fuzz, like along Still the true. mustache line here and like around like different parts of her face because graphics have gotten really powerful and the more powerful they get, the more you can enhance the realism of the characters that you're putting on the screen. So they decided to put some peach fuzz on different parts of her face, like to kind of show off, like, look how, look how great this is. Look how realistic these characters are. And then there was an outcry about, oh my God, she's got, you know, fuzz on her face. It's like, yeah, that's, because that's what people actually have. Like, just because we're females doesn't mean we don't have any hair on our faces. It's just, it's it's very light. It's very soft. It's, you know, you typically can't see it unless you get really freaking close and start, you know, looking for it. Um, so just some really kind of ridiculous dramatizations of issues that aren't actually issues. The fact that these whole things have came out to begin with, though, is a sign that things are moving in the right direction. Because mm -hmm. if there wasn't a group of people making a fuss, then it means that change isn't occurring because there will always be people who are resentful of that change, even if the change is mostly positive. It's always snowing somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I think if I'm not mistaken, there was a little bit of flack uh, in the esports community as well for a bit uh, because of the um, all-female team from Russia? Mm -hmm. Was it Russia? Yeah, the first pro esports all-female team was a Russian team called Vivictus, and they became famous for a series of catastrophic defeats, according to Nikolai. And this is sort of branded female gamers. Uh, the first and only all-female team in pro esports just happened to be a disaster, and mm. that has become a sort of definitive, um, even though, of course, we cannot judge an entire sex by the failure of one group of ill-prepared uh, esports players. Right. And, you know, it, definitely not. And it there's been, you know, plenty of catastrophic failures by all-male teams. Mm -hmm. But it's like, okay, there's so many all-male teams out there that it doesn't seem like 
a drop in the bucket when one of those teams does horrible, but then you finally get an all female team out there in a very male dominated space because esports especially is is very male dominated and well that th they're just not the best players you know that they they obviously had to be good enough to get into an esports league but they're they're not the best and and they went against people that were better at the game than them and and they lost and like that's just the reality of it somebody's going to lose but the fact that you take this um this one team and just decide that based on however many people were in the team i i esports teams are i think are usually around five it depends on the game obviously but let's just say five is like an average if you take a team of like five women and then decide that the fate of those five women determines like basically the skill level of every other woman came in out gamer out there like that is that is just such a huge and preposterous assumption to make to to take a small group of people and just be like well you're all like this and we we see this in other in other uh areas of life as well of course it, you know this this isn't something that just persists in sexism it persists in other areas as well topic for another day but yeah it's just it, it, it's kind of astounding to me sometimes how well, you can take 101 <laughs> yes it, it is and, and i guess at this point in my life i should not be astounded by anything stereotypical because you know that's just the the world that we uh were born into the world that we were raised in the world that we still live in but yeah i guess i guess this one hits a little bit harder than some of the other ones being uh, a woman in the gaming space and not one that has ever been super interested in esports but i definitely used to like watching other people in it and just thinking man you know how long is it going to take for women to be able to kind of climb out of that ditch and no longer be seen as the esports underdogs because one team just you know it just didn't have what it took to really rise the ranks well that's the thing about discrimination where there is this this sort of uh uh, eagerness uh, to identify failure and to embrace it with zeal as a kind of stamp on the uh, entire marginalized group mm. and then to maintain it. Yeah, for sure. Now let's talk a little bit about women within the gaming industry. So the industry is projected to reach 286 billion USD uh, by this year, according to figures by Statista, and 3.3 billion people are predicted to participate in gaming in 2024, according to Solari. So uh, obviously a huge industry and becoming bigger and bigger by the year. And uh, again, going back to what we were talking about earlier with the pandemic, I think the pandemic really did uh, create like an extra boom within the industry. It was already getting a lot of um, a lot of attention. It was already something that was, you know, transitioning from the only nerds do it to almost everyone does it. It was on that path, but I think the pandemic uh, really set it up to go even further. Um, so with the gaming industry growing so exponentially, how is the industry shifting so that it can include women? to actually support this uh, kind of crazy growth is going through. A 2020 study of the top 14 global gaming companies showed that 84% of executive positions in the industry were still held by men. And a 2015 gender balanced workforce survey reported by The Guardian showed that 45% of women working in the UK gaming industry believed that their gender limited their career prospects and 35% experienced bullying or harassment due to their gender. But the industry is interested in developing the cozy gaming genre um, as you previously pointed out. And 28% of the industry is female now. Uh, and those numbers are expected to rise in female coders and game designers as over a third of university STEM students are female. And more games are being released featuring LGBTQIA characters and female focus firms are working to expand the range of genres, including RPGs and MOBAs. All right, so, there, so there's some good news there. Uh, and I think more good news on the horizon. Um, obviously, we've still been seeing a lack of female support within the gaming industry. 
um, you know, 2015, showing some some not so great statistics with uh, women specifically in the gaming industry in the UK. Uh, 2020 showing that there's still a, a gap, uh, especially at the executive level uh, within the gaming industry. And that's not so surprising because we see a gap in other industries at the executive level as well. But, you know, 28% of the industry being female, it means the numbers are moving in the right direction. That number definitely needs to come up. Uh, yeah. There's definitely not enough representation, if you will, within the gaming industry for women, but it's headed in the right direction. And if we've got, you know, as the stats are saying, we've got a third of STEM students being female, then that is a sign that the younger generations should start coming into the gaming industry or at least something related there too uh, as they start to grow up. So people like myself in the millennial group, we will probably be seeing more of them potentially shifting uh, their careers towards something within the gaming industry like I myself am trying to do. And then people from Gen Z who um, some of them are now in the workforce. They're either in college or they're actually in what is probably their first or second um, job at this point. So I think that's probably where we're going to see uh, the most impact in getting women into the gaming industry is from the, the pool of Gen Zers that are you know, still new to the work world uh, and may not have even entered it yet. I know that they've been kind of a a big piece of different efforts within just the workplace um, in general. You know, you hear about things like lazy girl jobs and stuff. And, you know, this is all coming from the Gen Z group. Uh, and I think that they are going to be uh, an important force when it comes to getting the gaming industry more equalized between uh, men and women. Because we're not we're not trying to push men out. We're just trying to make space for women too. You know, mm -hmm. we want we want representation from all groups there and we want them all working together because that is the best way for us, the consumers, to get the best products. This has been Geeky Kitten and Analytica. Thank you for joining us on the Missing Links podcast. Please stay tuned for episode two, where we're going to focus on male allyship in the gaming space.